Section 1. You will hear a woman booking a room for a party at a community centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hi, good morning. My name's Pete. How can I help you? Hi, my name's Maria Lincoln. I understand you hire out rooms in the community centre as venues for parties? Yes, we do. We vary a sized accommodation, it depends on what you're looking for, really. We're looking to hold a party, a children's birthday party, and we need a room that will hold about 70 people, with space for a small disco area, games, dancing and food. Well, we have a large room, and it would certainly hold at least 100 people comfortably. It's used a lot for parties and things like that. That sounds as if it might be suitable. I've tried various venues, and they're either booked up or they don't hold enough people. Can you tell me when you were thinking of holding the party? I know it's short notice, but we wanted to hold it Saturday week. That's September 15th. Let's have a look. Uh, hmm, yes, you're in luck. The Mandela Suite is free then. I'll just write that down. M-A-N-D-E-L-A. A. And the time. When were you thinking of holding it? In the afternoon, from 3.30pm to 9pm. Yes, OK. There is no smoking on the premises, and we're only licensed to have soft drinks. Oh, that's OK. I think I'm happy to go ahead. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Can you just give your postcode? Yes, it's PA57GJ. Fine. And the flat and street number? It's flat number 40 and the street number is 35. OK, so that's flat 40, 35 Beaches Street. Yes, that's right. And a contact number? My landline is 223279 with the code. But I'll give you my mobile number, which is 07897293381. OK, 293381. Um, can you tell me how much it will cost? It's quite reasonable, actually. It's £115 for the hire of the room, with tables and chairs. But if you want to hire disco equipment, we've got a basic system with speakers and other equipment for £25. But there is no technician around in case anything goes wrong. And, of course, it's optional. Oh, that would save us carting something from home, but maybe we should bring a spare sound system just in case... We've never had any problem with the system, but you might not want to take any chances. What about catering? Well, we had thought of getting everyone bringing something. We have someone who can do catering for £9 a head, including the cake if required. Well, that's handy, but it's a lot, as we have a fairly tight budget.
So, you want to go ahead with the booking? Yes, certainly. OK. I need to take a deposit of £30, which is refundable. The balance needs to be paid two days before the event at the latest. Fine. You can cancel up to two days before, but after that you lose the deposit. We don't intend to cancel, but is there any insurance we can take out? Uh, yes, there's a, a form here somewhere. How much? It's, uh, oh, let me see. It's only £9 for the 24-hour period, and that covers you for cancellation, damage and injury. Well, at least we'd better have a look at it. How would you like to pay the deposit? Cash. I'll just give you a receipt. Uh, there you are. Ten, twenty, thirty. Thirty pounds. Uh, Maria Lincoln. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm really glad I found somewhere. We have been trying to book a place for the past two weeks, so thank you again, and uh, bye for now. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a talk on the radio about grass roofs. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 13. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 13. And now it's straight into the eco hotspot for today's programme. We are in fact going to look at an intriguing trend in recent years in the world of eco-friendly developments. There has been a constant stream of new green products coming onto the market for the environmentally conscious. A new departure, which I feel needs greater attention drawn to it, is the increasing interest in grass roofs. Environmentalists sing the praises of grass roofs as interest in sustainable ecological building has led to the greening of the rooftops of residential and commercial buildings around the world. And what does this type of roof consist of? Instead of tiles, which allow water to run off and create flash flooding, the roof has a waterproof underlay, which is laid over the roof deck. This waterproof layer is then covered with layers for insulation and drainage. Then, on top of the insulation and drainage layer, is added a final layer of soil or crushed stones for the plants and or grass to grow on. The roof can be planted with wildflowers to add colour and life to your rooftop. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 14 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 14 to 20. As for the benefits of grass roofs, in spring and in summer they are very pretty as flowers spring into bloom. Moreover, in summer, grass roofs are of particular benefit in cities because they keep any building cool by reflecting the sun's rays. In winter, the grass roofs insulate the building 
helping to prevent heat loss. The roofs require little maintenance and are better than any other roofing material. They encourage biodiversity by attracting bees and birds, and they absorb water runoff, which helps prevent flash flooding. In fact, the gravel layer retains 71% of the rainwater that falls, thus helping to prevent flash flooding. In winter, the brown soil is a bit more evident, which can look unattractive if the roofs are not tended carefully. But that is a price worth paying, and I would say that they come highly recommended by those who have them. If you compare grass roofs with tiles, the latter do certainly look very tidy, but at a price to the future of the planet. The main drawbacks of tiles, though, are the water runoff and the absorption of heat from the sun's rays in summer. So, if we are to save the planet from the ecological point of view, tiles do not come recommended. The only roof that I can think of which has similar ecological credentials to the grass roof is the thatched roof. Thatched roofs are good insulators and very attractive, but very pricey and not ideal for cities. How can we make more of our roofs green? That is, how can people be persuaded to install grass roofs? The World Green Roof Conference in Australia was a very good start. At a grass roots level, the best way to raise the profile of grass roofs is to make them trendy by highlighting them in fashionable magazines so that people begin to feel that they cannot do without them. But the idea I like best is holding competitions for the best designed grass roofs. Next week, Eco Hotspot is going to look at. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two university students, Phil and Stella, talking to their tutor about their research project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Come in. Ah, yes, Stella. Is Phil there too? Mm -hmm. Good. Come on in. OK, so you're here to discuss your research project. Have you decided what to focus on? You were thinking of something about the causes of mood changes, weren't you? Yes, but the last time we saw you, you suggested we narrowed it down to either the effects of weather or urban environment. So we've decided to focus on the effects of weather. Right, that's more manageable. So your goal is, uh, Phil? To prove the hypothesis, no, to investigate the hypothesis that the weather has an effect on a person's mood. Hmm, good. And uh, what's your thesis, Stella? Well, our thesis is that in general, when the weather's good, it has a positive effect on a person's mood, and bad weather has a negative effect. Hmm. Uh, can you define your terms here? For example, what do you mean by good and bad? OK. Well, good would be sunny, warm weather, and bad would be when it's cold and cloudy or raining. And how would you define an effect on a person's mood? What would you be looking to find? An effect on the way a person feels. Mm. 
a, a change in the way they feel, um, like from feeling happy and optimistic to sad and depressed. Right. And what sort of weather variables will you be looking at? Oh, sunshine, temperature, cloudiness, precipitation, among others. It'll depend a bit what the weather's like when we do the survey. Fine. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, what about background reading? I gave you some suggestions. Did you manage to read any of it? Yes. We read the Ross Vickers article, the one comparing the groups of American Marines training in summer and winter. Hmm. That's quite relevant to our study. It was interesting because the Marines who were training in the cold winter conditions tried to cheer themselves up by thinking of warm places, but it didn't really work. Yes, they were trying to force themselves to have a positive mental outlook, but in fact it had the opposite effect, and they ended up in a very negative state of mind. Mm. And we found some more research by someone who wasn't on the reading list you gave us, George Whitebourne. He compared people living in three countries with very different climatic conditions. Actually, he looked at several things, not just the weather. But he found some people's reactions to bad weather were much worse than others, and it was linked to how stressed they were generally. Uh, the weather on its own didn't have such a significant effect on mood. And we looked at a paper by Haver... Haverton. Yeah. He broke weather up into about 15 or 16 categories and did qualitative and quantitative research. He found that humans respond to conditions in the weather with immediate responses, such as fear or amazement. But these responses can also be linked to associations from their earlier life, such as a particular happy or sad event. Uh, did you have a look at Stanfield's work? Yes. It was interesting because the type of questions he asked was similar to what we were planning to use in our survey. Yes? He asked people how they were feeling on days with good and bad weather. He found the biggest factor seemed to be the humidity. Moods were most negative on days with a lot of rainfall. Long periods without sunshine had some effect, but nothing like as much. Hmm. That could be quite a useful model for your project. Yes, we thought so too. Although we can't continue our survey for as long as he did, he did his over a six-month period. You now have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Right. Well, you've made quite a good start. Uh, so, where are you going from here? Well, we've already made the questionnaire we're going to use for the survey. It's quite short, just eight questions. We're aiming to survey 20 people over a period of three months from October to December. We can't specify the actual dates yet because it depends on the weather. We want to do the survey on days with a range of different weather conditions. And we'll just be working on campus, so our data will only be statistically sound for the student population here. That's OK. Have you thought how you'll determine what will constitute each aspect of weather? And how many you're looking at? We decided on four. The amount of sunshine, cloudiness, temperature and precipitation. We thought we might use the internet to get data on weather conditions on the days we do the survey, but we haven't found the information we need, so we might have to measure it ourselves. We'll see. Then we've got to analyse the results, and we'll do that using a spreadsheet, giving numeric values to answers. And then, of course, we have to present our findings to the class, and we want to make it quite an interactive session. We want to involve the class in some way in the presentation, maybe by trying to create different climatic conditions in the classroom, <laughs> but we're still thinking about it. I see. Well, that sounds as if you're on the right lines. Now, what I'd suggest that you think about, in addition to the work you've done... That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk on seasonal affective disorder. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In the past few years, a new condition has been identified and given a name, SAD, short for Seasonal Affective Disorder. This is now recognized as a distinct kind of clinical depression, where people become depressed at the onset of winter, accompanied by a craving for sweet things, causing weight gain. Each spring and summer would then bring on almost maniacal highs and feelings of boundless energy and happiness. Experiments to combat this depression showed that increased exposure to bright light in humans could suppress their production of a darkness-related hormone called melatonin. The light needed to induce this change was about 2,000 lux, or about four times brighter than ordinary household lighting. It was then calculated that if bright light could suppress melatonin secretion, then it might have other effects on the brain, including the reversal of symptoms of depression. While melatonin's precise role in SAD has not been pinned down, the theory led to effective treatment. Not surprisingly, SAD affects more people where winter nights are longer and days shorter. In the UK, an estimated half a million adults develop a full-blown SAD in winter and twice this number suffer the milder condition called subsyndromal SAD. About 80% of sufferers improve when given light therapy and improvement usually comes within two to four days. Scientists are still unsure why winter depression happens but more than a decade of research has turned up some surprising findings. Nearly 80% of SAD victims are women. Researchers are uncertain why this is so. SAD can affect people at any age, but typically it begins around the age of 20 and becomes less common between 40 and 50. SAD is comparatively rare in children and adolescents, but so far researchers have been unable to come up with a logical reason for this. As many as half of SAD sufferers have at least one family member with depressive illness, suggesting that the depression has a genetic component. Some patients experience shifts in their body clocks when they're depressed in winter. They are morning people at one time of the year and become evening people at another. What is the underlying difference between SAD sufferers and others? A clue can be found in carbohydrate craving, a common symptom. People often become obsessed with chocolate, for example. Carbohydrates alter brain chemistry by increasing the level of a soothing chemical called serotonin, a neurotransmitter that carries signals between brain cells. Sad sufferers crave carbohydrates because they may need serotonin to lift their mood. This craving can be intense, in fact, an addiction. It may be that the serotonin system of the brain has problems regulating itself during the winter. Some sad sufferers respond well to the drug Prozac, thought to influence the brain's serotonin-using system. Other brain chemicals and hormones probably play a role in winter depression. Another neurotransmitter, dopamine, for example, may be inadequate in certain cases. Researchers hope to uncover clues to SAD secret by probing similarities between SAD and hibernation. Though no valid link between the two has been established, some SAD patients say they feel like hibernating animals. SAD sufferers tend to put on fat in autumn and early winter, roughly the time when such hibernators as bears and squirrels do. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.